Hi guys, my name is Mark, and today we're going to be doing the Higher Level 2022 Chemistry paper. In particular, we're going to be looking at question two, which in this case is a experiment question. So this question is going to be a, it's going to have multiple parts, so it's a little bit different to some of the normal experimental questions. And in this case, we're going to be looking at um, a few questions kind of relating to ethene and um, ethine and the preparation of it, as well as what we're going to be looking at um a little bit of work on benzoic acid and um, the kind of crystallization process that is associated with it. And um, yeah, let's get straight into question two, part A. So having a look at question two, part A, the first thing that we're going to be doing here is we're asked to draw a labeled diagram. And this is going to be drawing a labeled diagram for a suitable arrangement of an apparatus and of the chemicals uh, for preparation and collection uh, over water samples of pure ethene gas. So it's a, it's a fairly long introduction but basically the main takeaways here is we need to draw a label diagram um, for the preparation and collection of pure ethene gas. Um, and then after that, we're asked two questions based upon that. The first one is going to be in part I, which is going to be the how do we avoid um, the suck back of cold water into the reaction vessel, which is a common problem associated with this experiment. And in part two, we're asked how do we avoid um, a fire? So the first thing that we're going to do here is going to have a look at a um, diagram, and then we can answer our two other questions on the theory. So the first thing that we're going to be doing here is looking at a label diagram for the preparation and collection of ethene gas. And note that we're only asked to draw a label diagram, so in this case you don't need to give a paragraph kind of explaining what's going on. And here I've kind of just drawn a rough sketch of um, the apparatus required to prepare and collect ethene gas. And I'm just kind of labeling it now because we were asked to label it and it's super important that you actually remember to do that. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at here is the ethene. So the ethene is going to be collected in this little tube down here on the right hand side. It's actually just a test tube um, flipped upside down in a beehive, um, a beehive shelf in some water, and that's going to be collecting our ethene gas. Um, as well as that, we also have this Bunsen burner over here, which is going to be applying heat to our um, to our other test tube that is here as well. And um, inside the test tube, there's a few important things. First thing that we're going to know is that there's some glass wool soaked in ethanol. This is going to be kind of bunched up at one end of the um, test tube, and as well as that, we also have some alumina in the middle or aluminium oxide, and that's going to be kind of um, a powdery substance found in the middle of the test tube. So the important things to note whilst um, kind of doing this diagram, the important things you need to remember to include is the glass wool soaked in ethanol, the alumina that we've already covered, so the alumina down here, and um, the Bunsen burner or any form of like heat source, um, and as well as that we have our ethene, which is, you know, what we're kind of looking to create as well in this example. And um, yeah, these are kind of like the important things that you want to include. You can obviously label a few more things. You could label the beehive shelf and the delivery tube and all this other stuff, but the main ones are um, these few um, kind of points here. So for this diagram there was a total of nine marks going and the breakdown went as follows. The first thing you need to do was include a the kind of glass test tube holding the ethanol and um, soaked glass wool which is going to be where you get your first three marks from. You also get another three marks for including and um, this heat source which in this case is our Bunsen burner and then finally you got three marks for including the alumina which is inside of the test tube. So taking a look now at part uh, one and two of the theory for question A, we're going to be asked, how do we kind of uh, prevent against uh, suckback and fire? So for part A, we're going to be kind of tackling that first question, which is how do we avoid suckback? And the required solution in this instance is going to be that suckback can be actually avoided by lifting the delivery tube out of the water prior to removing the heat. So in this case, our source of heat is going to be that Bunsen burner. And as long as we lift the delivery tube out before we remove that Bunsen burner, um, what you'll find is that there's no vacuum created, which means that there's no suckback. Um, a, you know, problem that you'll find. Um, and then for part two, we're asked, how do we avoid um, fire occurring? And in this case, the easy answer that's kind of required here is that keeping the ethene gas separate from the flame, because ethene is going to be in itself quite flammable. And, you know, as long as we keep them separate from uh, the gas, separate from the flame, should I say, it will actually um, dramatically minimize the chances of fire. In this case, there was a total of four marks going for each of these. So the first one, you're going to get four marks for including the way I went about this answer was removing that delivery tube from the water before uh, removing the heat. A few different ways you could have kind of gone with that is by saying you just loosen the stopper or another way is just saying, you know, just make sure not to cool, uh, make sure not to turn off that Bunsen while it's in the water. Um, and then for part two, you also got another four marks for getting this one correct. And in this case, I went for just making sure the ethene gas, which is flammable, stays kind of separate from the flame. And another couple answers that you could have gone with is something like avoiding um, leaks uh, of the ethene gas, making sure all the stoppers are very kind of tightly sealed. And um, you could have also mentioned, um, you know, keeping 
um, you know, the close the container of ethanol after you set up or kind of just removing that flame, which is kind of what we went for in the end. So moving now on to part B here, we're going to be looking at um, some of like the tests that you can perform on ethene gas that kind of verify some of its properties. In this case, we're told that some ethene has been bubbled through a reagent, um, as shown in this diagram on the right-hand side. It's this diagram over here. And we're asked a few questions based on this. What we're asked is, what color change is observed when the reagent used is acidified, dilute acidified K-mineral 4? And as well as that, we're also asked about bromine water. So basically, what we're doing is mixing this ethene gas with um, a reagent, and we have two reagents in this case we're being asked questions on. The first one is that dilute acidified KMnO4 and the second one is bromine water and we're going to be asked what is the color change associated with each of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do both of these questions together because they're kind of related, they're both about a color change. So what we need to do first is um, kind of recall the color that it is initially and then what happens once it's been mixed and then we can move on to part three and part four afterwards. So in order to get your full marks here we need to be including a color at the start and then the color at the end and in the case of the the um, addition of the dilute acidified chemical 4, what we're going to see is a color change from purple to colorless. Now, you could also say in this case that pu uh, purple decolorizes. That's also another um, acceptable answer because in that case, it's just kind of replacing the word, um, you know, the phrase to colorless. It's just saying that it becomes colorless. Um, and you could also have a few different um, answers for purple. Anything like uh, you could have also said lilac and um, things like violet, pink, they're also perfectly acceptable as well. As for part two here, what we're going to be doing is once we add that bromine water to the ethene gas, we're going to see this bromine is going to go from, this bromine water, should I say, it's going to go from a brown color to a colorless color. So yet again, you could also say instead of, um, you know, talking about how it goes to colors, you could say it decolorizes. And um, brown in this case also has a few other colors that you could have gone with. So mainly things like red, um, orange, yellow, they're kind of in the same neighborhood. And you need to make sure that you get the order of these correct because um, you're not going to get the full marks if you don't get the ordering correct. And in this case, there was a total of three marks going for each of these. So you got three marks for saying, you know, purple to colorless for the KM04. And then you got another three marks for mentioning the fact that it goes from brown to colorless once you mix in that bromine water. So now that we've answered part one and part two of um, question B here, we're going to be moving on to part three and part four. And in this case, we're moving away from those color changes that we we're looking at before. And we're now moving on to, um, in, the, in part three, for example, we're asked to name the organic reaction type that occurs in the case of the bromine reagent. And in part four, then we're asked to identify an organic um, product of the reaction between ethene and bromine solution. So for part three, what we need to do is actually identify what's the you know type of the reaction that's actually occurring. And then in part four, what we need to do is name the product um, that is, you know, that, that actually comes into existence as a result of that reaction between ethene and the bromine solution. So to better answer these two um, questions, in this case, what I'm going to do is draw out the kind of the structures of what's actually happening once this reaction is occurring. So we have on the left here is our ethene. This is kind of hopefully a little bit familiar to you. Um, and we're mixing that with the bromine uh, reagent in this case. And we're asked, the first question is, what's the um, reaction type that's occurring? And then the last question we need to do part four is asking us what is the um, resultant, um, you know, what's the resultant um, organic product that's formed. So what's actually happening is we're mixing this ethene with this bromine solution. And on the right hand side, what we're seeing is this product is formed. So what actually happens is this product is eventually formed from the mixing of these two things, the reaction of these things two together. And we're being asked in part um, part three is what's, that rea what's the reaction type? And in this case, the reaction type is actually going to be addition. So as I was saying, part three's answer in this case is going to be addition. And just to explain kind of a little more context about what's going on here, the reason it's an addition reaction is because if we look over on the left-hand side here, beside kind of the little star that I've drawn, what we're doing is we're reacting that ethene and that bromine. And what's actually occurring is the bromine is being added onto that ethene molecule, as we see over here on the product side. And it can be actually seen here when these two bromines bond to the carbons in this case and are added on. So that's why this reaction is going to be an addition reaction. And moving now on to part four, the answer that's required, the actual organic um, product that's being created in this case, and I just wrote down here, it's one, two, dibromoethane. And actually can be seen here on the right-hand side. So what we can see is that we have these, you know, the familiar shape um, with two carbons, which means we're going to have that, um, that eth prefix. And the reason that we know it's going to be an ethane is because we have a load of single bonds. So in this case, what we're going to be getting out of this is an ethane. And um, just by looking at the actual overall structure, what we can 
can see is that the two bromines, as we had mentioned prior, um, are going to be added on to the whole structure in this case. And they're going to occupy the first carbon and the second carbon, respectively. As I can see, just kind of underlying them even again here, we have these two bromines added on. And the reason that we're going to be calling this 1,2-dibromoethane is because the bromines are going to occupy the first carbon and also the second carbon. And the, the name kind of comes from there. It's going to be 1, 2, and there's two bromines. So we're going to have di, and then we have bromo ethane. So just writing out the full length name where it's coming from, that's where you can get it from. Similarly, if you follow this, um, if you fo if you kind of follow the same reasoning, you might also come to a different answer, which is going to be two bromoethanol. That's also another um, one hundred percent correct answer, and it's kind of just a very similar reaction, but instead you've kind of grouping things a little bit different. And um, in this case, you'd get full marks for both. And it's important to note at this time that um, expanded structures for like the drawings, like as I have here, you know, this big drawing over here on the right hand side, this actual drawing itself is. Um, it is actually an acceptable answer um, and you know just because I think the examiner understands that you know what's actually going on here um, and for this question there was a total of three marks going for each of the subparts so in this case you got three marks for saying addition and you also got three marks for saying one two dibromoethane or as I said previously two bromoethanol and you could also of course draw them out like I have said previously or even write down the um, structural like chemical formula almost and um, that would also give you your full mark. So taking a look at part C here, we're going to be moving on from the ethene reaction that we were looking at before. I'm going to now be looking at the recrystallization of benzoic acid. And what we're being told here is that a student practiced this technique um, and it had some um, impurities in it. What he found is that there's some water-soluble potassium chloride and a little bit of um, some insoluble charcoal. And he said that the two filtration sta uh, stages in the recrystallization of the benzoic acid using water as the solvent are shown in these diagrams, so these diagrams that are um, below. And what we have to do is answer a few questions based off of these diagrams and the theory surrounding this um, experiment in general. So taking a look at part I here, we're going to be asked to identify the substances that collect at locations X, Y, and Z. So they're going to be um, three distinct um, three distinct compounds and uh, substances in this case. They're going to uh, be found at these little uh, different locations. And what we have to do is kind of label them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to label them first, and then I'm going to go through kind of what's happening to reach those points. So taking a look at what's actually occurring in these diagrams, what we're doing is we're actually pouring this um, mixture here through um, some filtration paper in a funnel here. And what's going to happen is by pouring it through the um, this kind of filtration paper, what you're going to uh, see occurring is that all the insoluble um, impurities are going to be filtered out. So anything that's insoluble is going to be filtered out. Now, if we recall from the question, we we're actually told that there was going to be a few um, impurities throughout. There was going to be something that was soluble and there's going to be insoluble and the insoluble one in this case was charcoal. So this means that the actual um, substance that's going to occur at X is going to be charcoal and it's because it is insoluble so it actually can't pass through um, the filter paper in this case. So when we begin to pour um, into the, uh, what in this case is going to be the vacuum filtration or the hot filtration um, apparatus here which you can see on the right hand side what you're going to find is that crystals are going to form up here in the y section and these crystals are actually going to be um crystals of benzoic acid which is actually what we're looking for so basically by filtering um the benzoic acid here and um, this benzoic acid should i say is going to be in a liquid state and it's also going to have any soluble impurities in it so by using vacuum filtration what's going to happen is it's going to separate those out and the benzoic acid itself is going to accumulate in these crystals uh in, in you know crystal form at the top here at part Y, in the location Y, should I say, and um, any insoluble impurities are actually going to now be filtered out and fall to the bottom. And it means that all of these, um, you know, insoluble impurities, which we were actually told about in the start of the question, are going to accumulate at the point Z. And in that case, they're going to be, uh, the uh, insoluble impurity is going to be potassium chloride. Or another way you could uh, dress it up is just by saying KCl, which is just kind of the shorthand way of saying potassium chloride. So these are the required solutions to get your full marks. And in this case, what you're going to find at X, as we mentioned before, is going to be some charcoal. And um, you could also say that this is the same as carbon because in this case, they're interchangeable. And um, at Y, we're going to find some benzoic acid. And if you wanted, you could also write out the form for this, which is going to be C6H5COOH, which is benzoic acid. 
or um, or should I say, and finally, at um, the point said, you're going to have your insoluble impurities filtered out, which is going to be in this case KCl, um, and it also, you know, you could also uh, have water here. And the reason you're going to have water here is because when you're doing a uh, hot filtration or vacuum filtration, what's going to occur actually is that um, it's going to separate out everything but the benzoic acid, and in this case, that means that there'll be a bit of water there as well, which we can kind of view as an impurity also. So in this case, there was going to be a total of nine marks going, and you got three marks for getting each of these correct. So in this case, the first correct answer would get you three marks, so charcoal, three more for getting benzoic acid, and three more for saying um, KCL or water for the final one. So taking a look at part two here, we're going to be asked what steps are carried out to maximize the yield of pure benzoic acid? Um, and in part two, we're asked between the first and the second filtration. So it seems that for the next few little parts, we're going to be answering a few questions on how do we maximize the yield of benzoic acid at different stages throughout the reaction. And in this case, we need to look between the first and the second filtrations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the answer um, and then I'm going to take you through it, kind of explaining uh, why that is the case and hopefully give you a little bit more context about what's going on here. So in part two, the answer that they're kind of looking for in this case is to evaporate some of the water off. And as I was saying previously, we kind of noticed that water is actually going to be coming out of the benzoic acid. Once we're doing the um, vacuum filtration, we're going to have is some water that's going to be seen as almost like a waste or like impurity in this case. And by removing that water, by boiling some of it off, um, you know, by heating the fil filtrate would be like another way of kind of saying this. By boiling off some of that water, what you're going to see is um, a higher overall um, yield of benzoic acid because obviously it's going to be more pure, it's going to be less um, water that present and that means that we're going to have an overall uh, larger yield and this is kind of most applicable between the first and the second filtrations to give us the most uh, benzoic acid possible. So there's a few different answers you could have gone with here. Um, in this case, I said evaporate off some of the water. Um, you could also say, you know, heating the filtrate or um, another um, example would be to put the flask in ice water, which would um, do kind of the similar, th uh, similar thing in maximizing the yield. Either way, there was a total of three marks going for this question and you got those three marks from um, getting, you know, this, this kind of just correct, I guess, in general and including those buzz terms. So yet again, evaporate or boil off the water would get you those full marks. So moving now on to part three here, as how can we maximize that benzoic acid yield after the second filtration? And very similar, I'm, or I should say very similarly to the previous question, what I'm going to be doing is writing out the correct answer and then taking you through it and explaining why that is the case. So in this case, the required solution to maximize that yield of benzoic acid after we have um, gone through the second filtration is that it should be then washed with ice cold water. And by washing it with um, an ice cold water and then drying those crystals, what's going to happen is more of the crystals can be, more of those crystals can actually be recovered and formed, which is overall once again going to lead to that higher um, yield of the benzoic acid. Now there's a couple of different ways, once again, you could have approached this. One of those could be to rinse the flask in which the crystal formed into the funnel, and this will actually help you create more um, or collect more, should I say, more crystals, which would yet again increase your overall yield. But in this case, the solution that I went with here, I feel like is the easiest one to remember and would probably the one that comes to my mind in an exam. Similarly to before, there was a total of three marks going and those three marks were going for just kind of including the buzz term, which in this case was washing it with ice cold water. And finally, now we are going to be moving on to part four, which in this case is asking how would you expect the melting point value of a recrystallized sample of benzoic acid differ to that of an impure sample. So basically, whenever asked us to compare um, and show the difference, what I tend to do is give you kind of a, to give an answer being like, oh, well, this is what the impure was like, and this is what the pure is like, and then kind of explain the difference. And that helps kind of highlight and explain to the examiner that you really do know what you're talking about. So in this case, what I'm going to do is explain um, what's the, you know, what the, you know, what's actually happening with the impure sample and the pure sample, and then use that to show the difference. So in the case of the difference, what's actually going to be happening is that the melting point will have increased and become sharper. And just a little bit of a clarification of what that means, we're going to have a shorter range. So if we think about the uh, more pure sample, what's actually going to happen is it's going to have a higher, it's going to have a higher um, melting point. So MP here being the, the shorthand for melting point. Um, and it's also going to be 
a sharper one. And if we compare that to what the impure sample is going to have, the impure crystals are actually going to have a significantly broader range because there's going to be more impurities present. And similarly, those impure crystals are also going to have a much lower, um, a much lower melting point. So the important takeaway from this answer is that the pure sample is going to have a higher melting point and a sharper melting point. Um, and that means that overall, the melting point between the two um, will have increased and become sharper with a shorter overall range. So if you got this um, correct, you'd be getting a total of six marks. And those six marks were just kind of going for explaining um, what the difference is. And you could have um, taken either road here, just kind of making sure the examiner understands that you know the difference is kind of how you get those six marks. In this case, explaining that the melting point is increased and much sharper for that higher uh, purity sample um, versus the lower purity sample would get you those six marks. Um, and yeah, that's how you would kind of um, make sure to get the full marks in this question.